We'd like to begin today's webinar by introducing our speakers today. First, we have Professor Bill Burnett, who's a consulting assistant faculty member in mechanical engineering and is currently the executive director of the design program. He manages our undergraduate and graduate programs in design at Stanford, both joint programs between mechanical engineering and the art department. In addition to his duties at Stanford, he serves as a board member of D2M, a product design consultancy, Dawson Energy, and advises several internet startup companies on design strategy. Welcome, Bill. I'd also like to introduce Professor Sherry Shepard from Mechanical Engineering, who is also the co-director of the Center for Design Research. Sherry is also the Carnegie Foundation Advancement of Teaching Consulting Scholar, principally responsible for the preparations for the Professions Program Engineering Study, the results of which are in the full report, Educating Engineers, Designing for the Future of the Field. Besides teaching both undergraduate and graduate design-related classes at Stanford, she conducts research on the development of academic and career interests and aspirations of college students and early career professionals. Welcome, Sherry. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Bill. Well, good morning. Um, I'd like to um, welcome everybody to our uh, webinar, and we'll start talking about innovation. Um, you know, we use the term uh, innovation, design thinking, uh, and um, the, the notion of designing for change, almost interchangeably. And this notion of design thinking or using the methods that designers use when they're designing objects or services or experiences in a more general sense to design strategies or business objectives. This thing we call design thinking, so started at Stanford, David Kelly, who's the founder of IDEO, uh, probably the premier product development uh, and innovation firm in the world, and also the founder of our new uh, graduate institute, the D School, was quoted as saying, we believe the next generation of innovators and leaders need to be great design thinkers. This is true whether you're in the design role or in a business role, in a program management role, or any place where you're, um, you're asked to come up with new ideas and change something. Because whenever you change anything, you're actually doing design. You may be doing design well, you may be doing design instinctively, you may be doing design accidentally, but when things change, you are designing. Design thinking is a process, and it has, and we break it into steps, the first step of which is we call empathy or empathize. It's a deep dive in the sort of uh, human need that uh, surrounds the problem or generates the problem. Uh, there's an empathize step, there's a defined step. There's an old saying that a problem well uh, defined is half solved, and we spend a lot of time framing and reframing problems based on the nuanced data that we get from our empathy uh, with users. Ideation or ideating, which is just the process of having many, many ideas. You have to have lots and lots of ideas if you want to choose a good one. Uh, you never go with your first idea. And then fundamental to our process is we believe that you build your way forward. You don't sort of think or decide your way forward. Design works on the kinds of problems called wicked problems where there really is no one right answer. There are many answers that, um, that can be optimized around different objectives. And you can never know fully all the boundary conditions of the problem you're working on because you're working with humans, you're working in complex systems, and some of the, um, the, the biggest issues are hidden until a solution emerges. And so we believe, unlike business thinking, where you sort of optimize between an A and B solution, or engineering thinking, which we do a lot of as well, where you um, isolate you know, uh, the dependent and independent variables and solve the equation, Design thinking is a process where you don't decide or analyze your way forward. You build your way forward. Um, we do this through a process called prototyping and testing. Actually, prototyping, testing, and then reprototyping and testing. Constantly putting things in the world for the users to engage with and to get the feedback that you need to understand what are the true boundary conditions of the problem. Um, Prototyping is also a way of creating alignment between yourself and your users, yourself and your management team. This is what we're actually doing, not what you thought we were doing in the slides you saw, and also between yourself and the team that you're working with. So prototyping is a way, we say, of creating a social space 
a space in which all of those people can interact with uh, the, the potential design solutions. The problem with this, of course, is that um, there's lots of processes in the world. And a process diagram, like the one I just showed you, doesn't really capture the nature of what design uh, and innovation is all about. I love this quote, culture eats process for lunch. It came from um, Alan Mullally, uh, uh, from, and, and it was actually quoted um, uh, uh, by, uh, by the, the CEO to one of our business school professors. He said he was walking through um, a lunchroom, uh, and one of the young engineers had put this quote up in a big printout uh, hanging on the wall, just as a kind of little piece of, um, you know, radical performance art or something inside Ford. And this came in response to a number of attempts by Ford in the early days of its turnaround to sort of reinvigorate the company by changing their processes. They would get a consulting firm in, in, in and they'd try to analyze why they weren't building good cars and why they were underperforming in their market, and they would change their process. They would add in a new step for conceptualization, or they'd add in another step for validation. And then when that process failed to evoke the results that they were looking for, they'd hire some more consultants, and they'd say, oh, well, you've got the wrong process, and they would put in another process. And once the CEO saw this quote, he realized he was managing the wrong thing. Um, you got to man the most important thing you can manage in any organizations, and you have many management levers to pull. You can manage the financial uh, health of an organization by looking at the numbers. You can manage the process health of an organization by looking at process. But the number one thing, particularly a CEO manages, is the culture. And Malayli's changed the culture from a culture of process-driven, um, uh, soulless car making to a corporation whose culture was all about cars again. You know, and he, he re in, reinvested in the culture of a car culture, people who loved cars, people who knew, knew instinctively the kinds of cars that their customers would love. And as you know, Ford is one of the few companies that didn't take a bailout and is also uh, one of the companies now that's working really, really well. And so rather than get into a big debate about whether the design thinking process that I outlined in the five hexagrams is really you know, uh, complete or whether there's another step in the beginning. Some people put accept in the front. Some people put um, uh, implement at the back. Rather than getting to that conversation, the way we think about it nowadays is design is a, is a, is a process, but design is also about creating culture. Design thinking and innovation come out of a culture that uses the methods of design um, to create the conversation about what it is that we're trying to do. So we like to think of it as well as being about creating culture, and that culture is first a culture of radical collaboration. Um, this is a slide, if you see there's um, five people in this slide, and it doesn't look maybe to be like these folks are doing anything radical, but the man on the uh, near right with the lovely head of gray hair is Terry Winograd, one of the senior people in computer science, one of the inventors of human-computer interaction. And the gentleman on the far left in the back is Bernie Roth, Professor Roth. He's one of the senior professors in the mechanical engineering school. He's a kinematics expert. And then scattered around, we have um, people from the design school, from the School of M uh, Management Science and Engineering. These are all folks from different parts of a very siloed organization called Stanford University but all working together on a project. And radical collaboration, we find, is probably one of the number one things that unlocks innovation in an organization. Getting people out of their discipline silos, engineering, marketing, sales, administration, manufacturing, whatever those silos are in your organization, and having them um, get together and work on projects uh, as equals in an organizational structure that is non-siloed and project-based. So part of this, um, it's actually a fairly, it is fairly radical for most organizations to allow this to happen. I have a young um, graduate student of mine who's down working in a um, aerospace company down in uh, the southern part of the U.S. Um, and she proposed a, um, uh, actually proposed and then executed a brainstorming session where 
uh, of all radical things, manufacturing and engineering actually sat down together to solve a problem. The brainstorming session was highly successful. People walked out of there very energized and thought that that might be a fun new way to work. She was pulled in to the vice president's office of her group, her engineering group, and told if she ever did that again, she'd be fired. So it is difficult often because when people collaborate across organizations, power shifts. Um, ultimately, if a team like this is enabled to, um, to really work and execute on their solutions, they will be given not only um, budgeting authority, but authority to redeploy uh, assets like people and, and materials. And that threatens the culture of most organizations. But we find this one thing, a culture of radical collaboration, is perhaps the single biggest thing you can do to kind of awaken innovation inside your organization. I mentioned empathy before, and it's truly a culture of empathy. People, you know, people talk about being close to the customer or understanding, you know, their market. Um, we think it goes much deeper than being close. It truly is an empathic relationship with customers, and we use the tools of um, cultural anthropology and ethnography to do observation. Almost every you know, organization is solving a problem for someone or some, some group of people. Um, and yet often when we talk to uh, design teams, engineering teams, sales teams, their connection to the customer is really secondhand. It's through their distribution or through their, uh, the buyers you know, at, a, at, at their end um, delivery point. And it's not directly with customers. Um, customers can help you co-create innovation, but you have to talk to them. And, and customers can't tell you what they want because they really only know what they have and what, you know, what, they, what they would prefer, but they can't, they can't predict the future for you. So you use, a, uh, use the techniques of ethnography, observation, interviewing, and, uh, and living in their environment. This isn't bringing customers into a focus group situation. This is you know, people in a radically collaborating team, all of them, going out and observing to look at, um, the, as I said, the nuanced behaviors of customers. Uh, and it's through these empathic processes that you get a data set of where the new solutions might lie. It's actually quite powerful. It's sort of subtle. Um, what's the difference between you know being close to your customer and being empath empathic with them? But it is um, it's really a quite a, a major step when organizations decide to use these tools to come up with um, new ideas. It's also a culture of ideas. Um, you know we believe in in all of the processes, and we teach a lot of these processes here at Stanford: uh, brainstorming, mind mapping, morphological analysis, biomimicry. Um, we have a biomimicry um, uh, lab here, our Obama Medic Lab, where we use nature as the inspiration for robotics. Um, the ability to generate lots and lots of ideas and not get stuck on any one idea is critical to this culture because it generates the sense of uh, great, great possibility uh, in the solution set. And then a culture of prototyping. We've talked about this. Um, I talked about this in terms of the, the process diagram. Prototypes are not the models that the engineering team builds to validate a design. Or prototypes are not just about things. You can prototype an experience. Um, there was a project with um, the emergency room over at Stanford that one of the classes did. Obviously, we can't be um, putting designers and other people inside an emergency room and messing up um, uh, you know, the hospital's uh, organization there. But we were able to um, uh, prototype an emergency room uh, through a proxy. Uh, many of the things that happen in the emergency room have to happen quickly and have to happen accurately, uh, and there is a tremendous time dependency. And the proxy that looked like a pretty good uh, um, substitute for that was the uh, pit crew at a NASCAR race. Very similar set of problems. Things have to happen quickly. They have to happen accurately. Um, they have to happen without, without failure. You can't have a tool fail or, you know, someone not have a tool when they need it. Um, and that turned out to be a pretty good proxy in the learnings in that situation. Uh, that prototype were able to be brought over to the emergency room. And you can prototype an experience. You can prototype a service. We've done prototyping uh, of a redesign of the Department of Motor Vehicles here in California. Um, all of these things can, um, can the, and the prototypes, again, are not necessarily supposed to be solutions. They're supposed to be the things that ask good questions and create a social space where 
the real nature of the problem can be explored and new data um, from the users can be elicited. So we really strongly believe in, in the prototyping culture. And all of that leads to um, essentially a culture that creates creative confidence. Uh, what we're doing at the D School, the, our graduate institute, is bringing students in from the business school, from the school of law, the school of medicine, the school of education, people who have had uh, essentially no design experience ever in their lives. And we're teaching them these principles of design thinking and, and you know, person after person is walking away, even after one 10-week class or even a, or two 10-week classes saying, you know, I've rediscovered my own personal creativity. I'm empowered again to have ideas. I understand how to visualize those ideas through prototyping. And I believe I'm a better team member for it. And whether they go back to become an investment banker, you know, from the business school or to become a teacher or an educator from the School of Education, um, they feel creatively more confident. And once you get an organization uh, or a team in an organization feeling this way, uh, watch out for the stuff that they're able to do. And once you start to infect this kind of thinking across the organization, um, you really start to see some big changes. So again, design thinking stands for this sort of a, dy a very dynamic approach to problem solving, because it works well in these poorly bounded problems, and it uses prototyping and iteration. Um, but it's also really an approach to problem finding. The whole idea of reframing problems based on a deep dive with users is really all about the problem finding part. I mean, we're pretty good at, at solving things. Most, most organizations are actually pretty, pretty effective at solving problems. It's just they're often working on the wrong problem or only a piece of the real problem. They're working on symptoms. And so using ethnography, empathic observation, and uh, redefining the solution space and using prototypes to provoke latent needs is really all about problem finding. And then, of course, it's a, it's a new perspective on value creation. Where does value come from in the organization? We do a lot of value optimization activities, total quality management, Six Sigma, things like that, optimize the value of what we are creating. But the value creation comes from focusing on these real end user needs. And that's where the high value, um, you know, uh, answers uh, lie. So that's 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 our sense of what design thinking stands for, both as a process and as a culture. Now, we want I want to shift over to this notion of um, getting the most out of innovation, and you know, uh, who are going to be your peak performers in the future, um, and um, and this this leads into the research of my colleague colleague Sherry Shepard. Um, so this notion of radical collaboration, let's just start there. How, you know, working across the silos and organizations, people um, who can, who have the tools to work on multidisciplinary teams that are really um, empowered to create change. So, it, you know, as I mentioned before, innovation always represents some change. If you're going to change something, you're going to do design. So we need to have an organization where everyone in the organization understands design thinking principles. And then we have this interesting shift happening in the workplace. The, the millennials, the sort of you know, 20 to 30 year olds uh, that are coming up in the world, coming out of you know, the university, the people that we're educating, they are coming. And in the next decade, um, they'll be responsible. They'll be a you know a, a significant percentage of the of the new workforce, and they're going to be responsible for most of the heavy lifting. Um, these are also, by the way, the, the same people who um, probably help most of us uh, when we can't figure out our Facebook page or we can't get our Twitter account working or we don't understand. This is the most digitally literate generation we've ever uh, educated here at Stanford or anywhere. Um, they have the, the best um, facility with the new digital communication tools of any generation. And what we've discovered in the research that Sherry's going to share with you, they are natural collaborators. They um, are bored with doing things uh, in a routine fashion and sort of crave innovation. And so we're proposing today in this webinar that they are really the underutilized weapon for peak performance and getting the most out of innovation in, in almost any organization. And with that, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sherry Shepard. Thanks, Bill. Um, it's great to be here and talk about culture, and, and the element of culture I'd like to focus on is 
you know, the people who are on the team and, and to the extent that there are differences in different um, life experiences and points of view that, that really could be leveraged um, to make a more innovative team. So I'm going to share some, some definitions, and these are um, kind of generalities about generational trends. We all don't fall particularly just in one um, grouping, but, you know, there is some some center of mass around when you were born and the experiences that you've had that, that do set you on a track in terms of expectations. And, and here are some groupings around um, mature silence, um, individuals born between 1928 and 1945, all the way up to millennials. And, and Bill, you know, as he was said, we're focusing on what do those younger workers really bring to the workforce that we could better take advantage of. Um, the women are participants range from um, uh, very few who are in that older generation to about 26%, 25% in the millennials. So some of you are millennials and some of you are in my generation, the, the, the baby boomers. What I want to focus on is that last row that, you know, every generation feels like it's smarter than the next. And I, in, in some ways that's uh, perhaps a hopeful, hopeful sign, believing that um, they can, can tackle um, world problems. Um, you also notice that the, the three older generations have this strong work ethic as saying that that's something that makes them unique around generations. Um, the thing I want to point out about the millennials is they don't necessarily put that in their top disting distinguishing characteristics, but they do have this sense of being tolerant, and that really is one of the characteristics that might be better leveraged in terms of, of teamwork, in terms of collaboration, in terms of ambiguity, um, in terms of prototyping, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a moment. Um, so that there might be a gap. This was actually from a webinar last year showing the age gap of participants. What this means is how much older you are than your average colleagues and or how much younger the bars below the line are individuals that are, are y much younger than their average colleagues and on the left-hand side those that are, are older. And what it does show is that in general we tend to work in um, heterogeneous groups in terms of those, those generational mixes. Um, so we can't just expect that all of our colleagues have had the same life experiences. So let's talk, oh, well, here actually to show some of the issues with um, millennials in terms of how they're even conceiving of what career might be is um, this quote from a study that came out last year by the, the Pew Foundation, and they found that two-thirds of the millennials say it is very likely or somewhat likely that they will switch careers at some point in their work life which really does represent a pretty radical change from older generations in terms of their conceptions of going with an organization and investing in it and staying it with it for a long time. Now, this quote could be a little bit scary in that, oh, people will continue to change jobs. Um, it also is a challenge to say how can we create an environment where, in fact, people want to, uh, to have a long, longer-term investment in, in contributing. Um, so the, here's one of the examples of differences in points of view. Here are some other examples of, of different experiences across those generational groupings. Um, the one of the rows is on learning styles. Um, we'll reinterpret that in terms of working styles, how you like to work. And um, the next row after that is teaching styles, and we might reinterpret that as managing styles. How how these individuals like to be managed or, or supervised. And what we find is, I'll compare the baby boomers to the millennials. Um, you could also do the same comparison with Generation X and the millennials. But what you notice is, is the baby boomers, again, my generation, um, working style is pay attention and work hard, work independently, and just figure things out. Just work at it by myself until, until I've got it. The millennials are, are really being um, educated in an environment, are really demanding and getting used to an environment where there's frequent interaction with faculty and peers, and so the problems are open-ended. It's a much more fluid, dynamic sort of work situation. In terms of management styles or, or teaching styles, um, you know, the notion of just hearing a lecture and, and having it be absorbed was much more the norm um, for the baby boomers versus the millennials wanting an interactive environment. 
So the idea of a millennial just sitting by themselves being told what to do and going away and doing it um, on their own is really not the norm that they're used to, um, in, particularly in the school environment. Let's talk a little bit about, you know, these dichotomies of old paradigms and new paradigms for teaching or manage, managing, um, and I'll just, you know, highlight a few of these. In ter terms of goals of the millennials, um, you know, the, the old paradigm might have been, you know, that their goal is to complete a set of, of requirements. Um, this newer generation really is much more focused on growth. You know, how can what I'm doing now help me become smarter, um, more creative? How does it fit into a longer-term plan? Which might seem like it's at odd with that, uh, you know, notion of I'm not necessarily going to a company and expecting to be there for my career. But in fact, they're thinking strategically about their own lifelong learning and how it helps them develop a career or, or realize a set of goals. Uh, a couple of others, relationships. Um, the old paradigm might be the workplaces in, in personal, informal, or actually formal, and now a much more mindset around personal transactions. Um, you know, having lunch together, doing things outside of work. Um, and let's look at a couple of more. Um, the old paradigm, competitive or individualistic among workers, and this newer generation is wanting to think about teams and cooperative learning. Um, Climate, I think this one's important, um, old paradigm on conformity and um, cultural uniformity, so, so how to have consistency within the group. The newer generation really is thinking about diversity, um, cultural diversity, um, and, and that that's something to actually hold within the group instead of, of pat down and get rid of. Um, and finally, the notion of where the power lies. Um, you know, the old paradigm for managing is that the faculty or the manager holds the power, and students, or, or now these early career professionals, are increasingly expecting that, that they are personally empowered to take on more leadership roles in terms of the projects they're working on. So let me tell you about a little of the work um, that I've personally been doing. Those other slides were from the Pew study. So we've been actually doing um, interviews of early career, um, principally focused engineers to figure out what's working for them and what isn't. And we've framed this around the notion of what's supporting them, what are, what are they seeing as their supports in terms of their being able to contribute to an organization, and what is forming barriers, uh, what's getting in the way of them really um, being contributing members. And then we've looked at, you know, the things that we're hearing from their interviews, and we've actually done interviews of their managers, and then being be able to group those supports and barriers in terms of um, elements that are at the company level, um, so the organization as a whole, elements that are at the manager level, um, so the smaller work group, and then even more in the work group, elements that, that really come from your colleagues and your peers with, within your local team. And um, this is a, a larger paper um, that's referenced on the bottom of the slide where one could read about all of these supports and barriers at these various levels. What I'd like to do is just focus on two of these and give an example of, of problems at the company level um, that are serving as barriers for these early career engineers coming up to speed, or I will, I will use the word that's commonly used, them becoming socialized into um, an organization and, and, and sometimes called the onboarding process. And one I'll focus on are problems with employee education, and the second is the, the lack of camaraderie with coworkers and the lack of team um, work with coworkers. So um, the examples I'll give are actually quotes um, in this kind of research. Um, you, you read interviews, you code them, you find common threads and elements, and, and so within that idea of a barrier around education, here's an example of what an employee would say. Um, and this employee is always wanting more of an overview, more overview, tell me about the whole company process and procedures um, and how they work. And uh, this was a frustration where um, this young engineer who'd been with the organization about a year had been given um, a particular task um, to achieve, um, but at the same time, he really wanted to know how does that task fit into how the company works. 
um, what the philosophy is of the company. And so while the company felt they were giving him a good education and, and um, attending to that in terms of giving him the nuts and bolts of a particular process, they'd failed to really give him a sense of how does that, that thing he's working on fit into the bigger landscape of what the company um, was about. Um, we could go in with more quotes, and that paper has more um, definition of, of that uh, company-level education process, but I want to give you another taste around the issue of coworker teamwork and camaraderie. So this young engineer is, is really expressing um, the, kind of the dichotomy or differences they, they felt within the school environment and the work environment. He's saying maybe it's this feeling of in school they teach you all about this teamwork effort, but then you come out here and I don't feel like I'm part of a team. I don't feel like there's um, any kind of teamwork thing. Everybody's got their projects and that's all they're focused on is that they need to take care of this project and they need to do this and don't bother me. So, you know, I think this young engineer was feeling disappointment in that they'd really been groomed and were getting excited about being part of that, that culture, for instance, that Bill was talking about, and then they got their task and were, were not at all part of something bigger than themselves. Um, the second quote has some other um, feelings expressed. I work in a group, and essentially that is sort of a team, but I don't really feel a team atmosphere like we're all working towards something together. The culture that Bill was talking about is, is very much where everybody brings an essential piece to it. Um, the, the diversity of backgrounds are, are really a key element. And yet this engineer is really expressing that they have their task and, and again, they're not part of something bigger than just what they're contributing. So I could talk a lot more about kind of these differences um, between millennials and other generations. Um, we do know a lot about the generational characteristics, um, both from a teaching and learning standpoint, but also from a managing and work group um, standpoint. There are some gaps, um, differences in expectations among the groups, um, but there are really some, some potentially um, good leverage points with the millennials. They are really increasingly used to working on teams. Um, it's becoming part of their educational process. They're interested in collaborative work where they see that various individuals uniquely bring different points of view to the problem that, that make the solution better. Um, so they want to engage in this work. Um, and yet in the workplace, they're sometimes facing um, a, a counterculture, if you will, that do doesn't want the team effort being there or the collaborative work, and there's a disappointment. So this really does represent something for companies to look at in terms of, of really how to um, take advantage of, of what this younger generation is bringing with them in terms of how they want to um, how they want to work. Well, thank you, Sherry and Bill. Um, you know, before um, I get into a little bit about how you can learn more, I'd like to encourage you to continue asking uh, questions. We've been seeing them come into the queue, but we'll be ho uh, hosting a, a question and answer period with Bill and Sherry at the end of the of the webinar today. So please uh, continue to ask questions while I give you a little bit more information. At the Stanford Center for Professional Development, we've been delivering education to industry for over 40 years. And so we have reasonable experience in creating educational programs to address the career-long learning needs of professionals, managers, and executives in industry. We at Stanford are pleased to be offering the Innovation Master Series in partnership with faculty like Bill and Sherry. For three days, senior faculty will lead you through hands-on workshops where you will learn the problem-solving tools and problem-finding frameworks that lead to innovation and strategic leadership pioneered by the Design Group and the D School at Stanford. We designed this program for managers, business leaders, and decision makers faced with the daunting task of retooling and revitalizing their enterprises. Here you can get a sense of who might benefit from attending. And as Bill mentioned, anyone ranging from project teams to um, innovation leaders, et cetera, can really benefit from the content here. We created this program because we've been hearing how organizations struggle to make innovation routine for quite some time. In today's business environment, companies continue to be challenged to implement more projects with fewer resources. Here you can see some of the key takeaways that can help you navigate tomorrow's business challenges to impact the long-term success of your organization.
One of the most unique aspects of the program is that you will get the opportunity to engage with a who's who lineup of faculty from the Stanford Design Group and the D School, who have pioneered design thinking to solve today's wicked problems, like the challenges you heard from Bill and Sherry today. So now, we'd really appreciate your feedback on this poll. If you could please take a moment to indicate your interest um, in the Innovation Master Series, um, it would be really great. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. And with that, I'd like to move on to our question and answer session. Um, some of these questions are better answered orally. So the first question here is, in a large organization, usually the empathy process is done by the customer department. Um, and it's far away from the design department. And sometimes the information doesn't flow between those two very well. Yeah, this is a classic example of sort of siloed organizations, and I'm not sure who exactly the customer department is. Sometimes that's customer service, sometimes that's marketing, if you're looking forward at new product development. And, um, you know, this is the classic game of telephone, right, where somebody says something to somebody who says something to somebody, or and, and then by the time I get it in design or I'm trying to come up with a unique new solution, I don't even really understand who I'm dealing with. This is also, um, you know, this is, this is just the, the common failure mode. People try to capture the insights from customers in a marketing requirements document or a customer requirements document, and then then the design team or engineering team responds with an engineering response document. And we go back and forth and back and forth, and somewhere in that whole process, the, what I call the nuanced data set, the latent needs, the things that people can't tell you but they show you are lost. Look, customers can't come up with a brand new idea for you. Customers, no, no amount of customer research will develop an iPhone. Um, and, and Apple is famous for saying, oh, we don't do customer research. Um, we just know what people want. We just give them insanely great, wonderful things, and then they just buy them. Uh, part of that's true. They do make some insanely great, wonderful things. But I was at Apple for seven years, and I can tell you that Apple does more research with customers than any company I know of, not about what is the new product we should do. It didn't take too much of a genius to figure out that they should probably do a phone and get into mobile, you know, um, smartphone applications because that's the, that's the future. And if you actually think about it, Apple in the last five years has only done two new products, a phone and a pad. Everything else is a line extension. So Apple doesn't do research about whether people want a phone from them. But once they've decided to do a phone to make it as easy to use and as insanely great as Steve would, would say uh, it should be, they do countless hours of work. And the design team is observing uh, directly um, how people use the phone, what their, what their consternations are, why they can't make something work, or how to make something even easier. To make something as simple and, and as easy as the interface uh, in most Apple products takes Years and years and years of work with customers. So you cannot, you, you know, to do that kind of work, you cannot have this gap between whatever the customer department is and whoever is, is implementing the design of new products. Because um, all of the all of the important data, not the not you know, people want two ports and they want you know this many gigabytes and that big a screen. None of that stuff. That's easy. You can capture that in the document. But the part that's really critical. That, that grimace on someone's face when they try to do something and it doesn't work, that will be lost and you will develop, you know, subpar products um, and services um, if, you, if you don't do the radical collaboration. And this is where the radical collaboration is hard because it means someone in the customer department is going to have to collaborate and take feedback from and modify the stuff that they do because someone from service or sales or manufacturing or design was in the group with them. Thank you, Bill. So our next question is, do you believe that this process is equally applicable to communication design? Again, here, why don't I take this one? Um, you know, communication design um, and uh, branding and advertising and um, uh, the, all, all of the work around uh, marketing and communication um, actually, we find that those are the teams that most readily flip to being design thinking style teams because they're already um, uh, used to the creative processes. They probably do a lot of brainstorming and, and a lot of visual um, creativity to come up with um, their new ideas. And so it's just a matter of 
of connecting them more directly to um, the ethno ethnographic practices and observational practices that can really empower their um, thinking with new ideas. So I think it works with communication design. Um, I mean, it works essentially. Again, if you're going to if you change your business strategy, if you change your your um, the, the way you make money, you are redesigning something. And so all of these principles work across the board in almost any of these um, uh, you know, business disciplines. Thank you, Bill. Um, so our next question, is this research global and does it cover cross-cultural issues or is this just based on millennials who are born in the United States? Um, the work that I presented is principally focused on millennials born in the U.S. Um, I think many of the underlying questions about the educational framework and the cultural expectations the same questions apply. The answers may be different, and I think we're really in a, a pretty dynamic, shifting environment where the idea of the millennials, if, if, if we use that around um, when people were born, um, and we recognize, for instance, our workforce now may have someone who was born in those years but actually grew up in China or India or Japan, and so they're going to bring, again, different expectations. I think the underlying message is figure out what some of those motivations are of, of the people who you want to be in a team so that, in fact, you can leverage the particular assets they may be bringing um, into play. Yeah, I just wanted to build on that. Um, we do have a class here um, called Cross-Cultural Design. One of the other professors, Professor Hines uh, and Professor Banerjee, teach that class. And it's a class where we're doing design thinking Half the class is in the U.S., half the class is in Peking University in, uh, in Beijing, China. Um, and we do find that there are some significant cultural differences, particularly around the brainstorming um, and other processes which um, rely on a kind of non-hierarchical, everybody's idea is good, everybody can build on the ideas of other sort of processes. And particularly in more hierarchical cultures, uh, Asian cultures, it's a fairly difficult translation. Um, and so, you know, we're working on evolving uh, uh, modified tools for brainstorming in situations where um, it's, it's actually a pretty big issue to um, have a manager who's in a, in a top-down hierarchical culture is supposed to have all the good ideas. Um, to, um, to create a process where people can still have ideas in an open uh, in kind of unframed way without any loss of face for people in the hierarchy. But um, in general, uh, you know, these, the, there, there are differences culturally, but um, as Cher mentioned, the studies were done in the U.S. and they were done with multicultural, you know, uh, engineers. I think, what, half of our graduate students now come from outside the U.S.? Great. Thank you. So our next question here is, um, I thought that Generation X was defined by quote-unquote slackers, yet you mentioned that they were praised for their work ethic. Just curious if this perception has changed or if they've just grown up. Good question. And uh, those characteristics were actually generated by that individual group themselves at the time of the survey in 2009-2010. So this was Generation X as 40-something saying what is their unique characteristic relative to the generation that's older or the generation um, that are, um, are younger. So it, so it does seem that Generation X now as 30-somethings, 40-somethings um, see themselves as, as being in there with that work ethic, even though they may have been perceived by others when they were younger as being slackers. <laughs> um Great. So, so what is a good way to introduce design thinking into your workplace um, so that others can see the practical benefits and not just wave it off as another business fad? Yeah, the whole business fad thing is a, is, um, a real danger, and I, I worry sometimes uh, because we um, we talk about design thinking so much that it can be perceived as just another, you know, uh, repackaging of some old ideas. Um, I think it's actually more substantial than that, but. Um, you know, it's it's reasonable for people in an organization to say, well, show me. Why should I change? This is just, you know, I, I, what we're doing may not be working well, but we know how to do it. Um, our suggestion, and we've seen this be successful again and again, um, is you can't change an organization overnight. Um, you change it project by project. 
um, pick a high impact project, a project that has significant um, rewards if successful and significant downside if it uh, if it fails. You can't pick a project nobody cares about um, because those are just doomed, you know, to to be boring no matter what. But pick a, a high impact project that has, um, you know, a reasonable um, uh, importance to the organization. Assemble a truly multidisciplinary team, not not the task force of the people who have nothing else to do or the people that are aren't aren't important enough to stay on their jobs. I, I'd like to think of it as a great jazz trio or jazz quintet. You know, pick the Miles Davis, the Dizzy Gillespie, you know, um, the Dave Brubeck of your organizations and put a really good band together. Find a hard problem. Empower them to, um, uh, you know, command the resources and, and um, time that they need to do it. And then... Um, you know, see what kind of a success they have and expect that, that along the way they will prototype many, many, many things that fail. We believe in failing often to succeed early, er. And, um, let, let that, let that, uh, process unfold. Uh, predictably we would think you'll, you'll end up with a success or a, a nonlinearly new solution, a solution you would not have expected. And then, you know, spend some time reflecting on how was that different than the way other projects normally go. Um, what was unique about it, um, where did it work, where did it fail. Um, we find that if you can infect an organization with one or two successful projects organized this way rather than around functions, um, the, uh, the people start to see the benefits. You also, you know, other people will be threatened by the fact that, you know, the power structure has changed and that people who are not in the functional organization have authority to, you know, to spend money and move resources around. But normally you'll, you'll, um, You'll notice a quantitative change in the output, an, an interesting innovation um, that was not expected, and a group of people who are really excited about a new way of working. Thank you. Um, so since many of our teaching and managing models um, have been designed by either baby boomers or Gen X, do you believe that these may not sort of feel the needs of millennials? Um. So, so I think that it's a good point that the, the new tools, the new strategies have been, in fact, created and designed by um, baby boomers and Generation X. And I would say, actually, underscoring a lot of that design work on these new models is a, um, a whole field called the learning sciences, um, where we're really understanding much more that people don't learn particularly effectively by believing that we kind of open their brain up and pour stuff in and, and learning happens. Um, there's a much more nuanced understanding of, of the, the learner actually needing to be engaged and having to struggle with the ideas along the way and the need for scaffolding of, of the, the, the challenges that are given to a student. Um, so those learning sci science backgrounds have informed what these baby boomers and Generation X have done in terms of creating new models. A couple of things I would add to that. It, it's not ubiquitous um, in terms of um, teamwork being part of a student's experience in every class. The reality is that some students, engineering students, may just get to be doing some design their final semester of their senior year, whereas other programs have really embraced the idea of needing to do design and iterate on it and make mistakes and try doing design again from the beginning of the freshman year to the senior year. So um, one thing I would say is, is the models haven't really gotten into too fully into every program. Um, and, you know, I do think they feel the need of millennials now I want to talk a little bit more about the managing um, aspect of this or, or how it might play out in the workforce. Um, these millennials want to feel that their work is important, you know, that they really are doing something that's, that's critical for themselves, critical for the organization they're working with, and will have a, a more global impact. Um, at the same time, they need scaffolding in the work, you know, that they're not equipped to come in and be challenged with something and say, well, go out and figure this out over the next six months. So how do people, as their supervisors and managers, give them enough input and direction to not be micromanaging it, but to, to be pushing them or urging them or coaching them or mentoring them, whatever um, descriptor you want to get, so that they can figure out what resources they need to bring to bear um, to take on this task that they've also gotten a sense of is important to the organization. 
Um, I think we have more to do in terms of thinking about those teaching and managing models. Um, but I really do think some of the things we're seeing in terms of the learning environment really do have some traction um, in terms of the work world. Great. So our final question, um, how would you compare the Roger Martin School of Thought on design thinking with what's being taught at Stanford, the IDEO School of Thought? Yeah, this is a great question for a, a, a couple of reasons. Um, first of all, Roger Martin is the dean of the Rotman School of Management at the University of Toronto, and he's written a fantastic book. I actually mentioned the book in a webinar we did last month. It's called The Design of Business. Uh, and Roger um, has, has, has been quoted as saying it shouldn't be a master's of business administration, which is simply the you know, caretaking of something. It should be a master of business creation or business design, an MBD. Um, and uh, Roger uh, and, uh, and we are great friends. Uh, he's been out to speak at Stanford a number of times, and um, David Kelly and some of our other professors have, been, have spoken at the Rotman School. So there is actually um, really no difference in the underlying philosophy. Uh, by the way, this notion of an IDEO school of thought, I like to think of IDEO as our best little startup. David Kelly was a grad student when I was a senior here many years ago and created a company based on um, all of the work that the, um, the founders of the design program at Stanford, a guy named um, Bob McKim, um, uh, another guy named Rolf Fosti, um, who took it, on, took it on later, um, have generated. So almost all of these ideas that, you know, are sort of IDEO, um, uh, uh, I, that IDEO has taken out into the world, really were generated here first. But Roger's, um, Roger, is, if, you, if you're interested in a, a great business book on design thinking, the design of business is, is probably the best. And what he does is reframe some of our ideas uh, more into business concepts that might, might, that translation of language might make it more, um, more acceptable or easier for you to explain it to folks in the boardroom. Um, he talks about, you know, uh, an idea funnel going from, you know, um, uh, sort of, uh, big ideas to heuristics to rules, um, and when in the process do you want to use design to change the heuristics? And so um, I, I highly recommend the book. Um, and Roger is a great thinker. He's also publishing quite a bit um, there. Um, I forget the name of the Rotman Schools magazine, but they have a business publication magazine, much like the Harvard Business Review. And it's got some of the best um, research work on how design thinking uh, can penetrate organizations and how the implementation uh, occurs. So I highly encourage um, you to look at his stuff. Well, thank you again, Bill and Sherry. I think that was a great presentation, and we also appreciate all of the great questions that you've submitted. Um, what we'll do is there's still a few questions in the queue, and so our presenters will be um, hanging out to answer those um, after the webinar. I just want to close. Um, here's some information here with um, – some dates, June 15 to 17, we'll be holding the Innovation Master Series that I referred to, and there's an early registration deadline there of April 8th, as well as some contact details um, for our Associate Director, Eve Byer, who's managing um, that effort. So thank you again for joining us, and, and we'll be uh, answering all the remaining questions in the queue. Bye-bye.